we're starting dynamics. Today, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, we'll just, I'll start out saying something about conservative forces, and then we'll get to uh, 1D examples of single particle dynamics. Then we'll look at 2D, 3D examples. That'll probably take us to the end, okay? So just continuing from where we were last time, uh, we were looking at, and this is all in uh, chapter two, okay? We were talking about dynamics, introducing Newton's laws, Newton's first law, Newton's second law, which is F equals MA, Newton's uh, third law is uh, the equal and opposite reactions. There's also Newton's law of universal gravitation, which plays an important role when we're talking about spacecraft and things. So let me get the diagram here of what we're talking about. If you have a, an inertial frame, we we'll use N to remind us that's where Newton's laws apply. You've got two point masses. We're talking about point masses for now. So here's location of particle one, and then here's location of particle two. And if you write the location of particle two with respect to one, we call that R12. R12 is R2 minus R1. And the force of gravity, uh, we might care about the force of gravity of each one on the other, but mostly we care about, think of M1 as the larger mass and M2 as the smaller one. So then we're looking at the force uh, on particle two due to one. And Newton's universal law of gravity says that uh, F1, F2, one is negative a constant G and then the product of the two masses over the distance between the two. So that's magnitude of R12 squared. And then to give a direction to this, this is R12 over magnitude of R12. Or we might write this as, let's say, E sub R. Right. It is a, it's a vector that's pointing in the R12 direction, but it's, has, it's a unit vector. So this is the law. Right. This governs orbital dynamics. And it's also an example of a conservative force. Um, if you if you want me to write G, it's not really important right now, but it's uh, about 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 in SI units, so me meters cubed over second squared kilogram. And G is called the universal gravity constant. Um, F, in this case, uh, is like I said, a it's a conservative force. And what do we mean by that? We just mean the, that it comes from a potential, or sometimes we say it comes from a potential energy. So in this case, what is that? We would say F, in general, a force that's conservative. You can only write forces that depend only on position as being conservative. So if a force comes from a potential energy, we say it comes from it this way. So this is... This is the gradient. So the gradient operator, relatively easy to write in Cartesian coordinates, um, looks more complicated in cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So that's the gradient. And then this thing V, this is a scalar function V R. So it's a scalar function of the position. So in this case up here where we've got F21, F21 is a function of R12 and it's the negative gradient of the force due to gravity, which is a function of R12. Or what is that potential energy? That potential energy is negative G M1 M2 over the magnitude of R12, right? This is the often said as a one over R potential because it's only dependence on position is one over the magnitude of the distance between the two. So it's one over R. 
And if you work out what the gradient operator is, it'll give you this equation up here in the upper right. We'll mostly be dealing with gravity, but we might encounter other forces and often they'll be conservative. So another force that's conservative that you would have seen in an earlier dynamics course would be the force due to stretch in a spring. So if we just think of you know, 1D stretch of a spring, or we might call it the restoring force of the spring. Right, if we, here's a wall, here's a spring attached to a mass. We've got a spring constant. And let's say we've drawing these two dashed lines. This first dashed line is the equilibrium location of the spring. And then the other dashed line is its current location. So let's put an arrow X. So X is the stretch in the spring. And it could be positive or negative. The force, sorry, the potential energy, or we usually use V due to the spring, would be a function of just this scalar X. So we're only looking at one dimension. So this would be one half K X squared. So that leads to a force that's going to be negative partial V S partial X. So it's negative kx. You get the usual restoring force due to a spring. We'll encounter these potential energies later when we talk about conservation of energy and kinetic energy. But right now, I want to you know, shift to looking at 1D examples of applying Newton's laws. So we're going to look now at just 1D examples of applying Newton's laws. And I think this will be instructive. Eventually, we're going to have to look at things in 3D, but may as well for now. Look at 1D and then go to 2D and, and so on. And eventually, we'll also be applying the transport theorem. Transport theorem won't mean anything in uh, 1D. So 1D examples of you know, applying Newton's laws. And this is would be in, this is in section 2.3. I'm not going to do all of the examples they have or do them in the exact same way. If you want, you can see it there. But the simplest case, so 1D is the simplest situation because it's just one dimension. So we don't really have to worry about the taking it into account how unit vectors are changing. And the simplest case would be no force at all. So think of just the got a one-dimensional world. If you want, you know, there's this N1 inertial vector, but it's not really relevant. The particle is um, at some distance from an origin. So let's call this origin O. So this would be X. If we were to write Newton's laws, right? F equals MA. It's now scalar. It's not a vector. If we're saying force is zero, that means we've got something sort of moving in free space. And what is A? A is first derivative of the velocity, or think of it as the second derivative with respect to time of the radius r, but in this case, that's just x. So we've got x double dot. How can we think about this? So zero equals m v dot. That's one way to write it. This would imply that the velocity is constant. And we mean constant with time. So that would mean that the velocity at any time is a constant, and it's also equal to what velocity was at some initial time. So initial time, we'll call that t equals zero. Uh, we could also write this as is zero as m x double dot. So let's say we started from that. Well, we could divide both sides by m, and so we've got, uh, we'll rewrite it this way, x double dot equals zero, okay? And then x, what is x double dot? This is d by dt, of x dot, which then we could write this. Uh, we've got dx dot on one side equals dt on the other, and we can integrate both sides. So if we integrate both sides, um, well, actually, this is a zero over here. Boop, boop, boop. Yep. So it's zero times dt. So it's just zero because of this. So integrate both sides. This becomes x dot at t plus, I'll write it as c1, the first constant of integration equals zero. And then you could evaluate at the initial time to find out what that constant c1 is. So 
we've got x dot zero plus c1 equals zero. So what does that imply? That c1 is the negative of the initial x dot. So we've got x dot at any time minus x dot at the initial time equals zero, which implies x dot at t equals x dot at zero. So that's the same thing that we have up here when we wrote it in terms of velocity. This is just starting out saying, well, Newton's law is just a second order ODE. So let's use methods of how to evaluate second order o ODEs. You know, this is for all time. So the velocity x dot is constant and it's equal to whatever it was initially, this thing, x dot at zero. Okay, but this is also an ODE. We've got dx, right, x dot at any time is dx dt, and it's equal to x dot at time zero, but that's, that's just a constant, that's just some number. So if we rearrange this to make it look like an integral, we've got x on one side and then x dot zero dt integrate both sides. Since x dot evaluated at zero is a constant, I can pull it out of that integral. And then when I evaluate this, right, what do I get? I get the current position is the, you just apply the same methods as before. You get another constant of integration that you could evaluate. It'll be the initial position plus x dot at zero and the elapsed time. So this is just the initial position in that one dimension. This is the initial velocity this is the current position. And it might be useful to just plot what this gives us in the sense of uh, x versus time t. So if we have, here's our initial position. This is just a straight line plot, something like that. And the slope is x dot zero. The slope is the, the one dimensional speed. I guess I could also write here, this is uh, t equals zero. So that's constant or zero force. So when there's zero force, the, the, the velocity doesn't, doesn't change and you just move in straight line motion with constant speed. Things get a little bit more interesting when we look at the case of constant force. So that would be the next simplest situation. Uh, constant. It's in section 2.3.1. So for example, uh, gravity near the surface of the earth. I'll do the same di one dimensional diagram as before. We've got some origin and then our point P, which is a mass. And let's say we've got a constant force. So here the free body diagram, if you want, is just it's a line, it's F is a constant. So the Newton's law F equals M A, well, F is a constant. So we could just immediately rewrite this as the acceleration is F over M. Well, M is a constant. So that means A is a constant. So the acceleration A is F divided by M is also a constant. And like before rearranging, uh, well, writing what A is in terms of time derivatives of X, X is tracking the position. A is DX dot DT and it's a constant. So we've got D x dot dt equals, uh, I'll just write it as a, and by a I mean the constant, I suppose. Um, if that's 
maybe too troubling. I'll put f over m. All right, so we've got, and this thing over here is a constant. So now separate variables. So dx dot on one side equals f over m and t. So we're separating the variable x dot and the variable t. Then integrate both sides. f over m is a constant, so it's not in the integral. If you evaluate this, what will you get? You'll get x dot. And I'm just putting in here that I know this is going to be a function of time. So the right-hand side, it's uh, f over m times t plus a, again, a constant of integration. I could evaluate that constant of integration. So let's evaluate at the initial time, t equals zero. And we get what? Okay, so x dot at zero equals well, f over m times zero plus c1. So now I know what c1 is. It's the initial velocity. All right. But then this, if I rewrite what is x dot, I know x dot is dx dt. So I've got my ordinary differential equation for x equals uh, f over m times t plus x dot zero, some initial velocity. Use the same procedure of separating variables. So I want everything that depends on x on one side and then things that depend on t on the other side. So I have dx equals f over m t plus x dot zero dt integrate both sides now now i when i integrate um, because this expression in the parentheses depends on time i've got to include that what will i get x over here on the left hand side on the right hand side uh, i i know how to evaluate an integral like this so it's i get one half f over m t squared plus x dot at the initial time times t plus another constant of integration. Maybe I'll call that c2. If you plug in to evaluate this at time t equals zero, you'll find out that c2 is just equal to the initial position. So that's that. And we could even, we could plot this just to compare and contrast with what we get for no force. Here, we've got at time t equals zero, we're at position x zero, and then this changes, this isn't a straight line, it's quadratic. So x looks, you know, curved. So x changes quadratically with uh, time t. All right, because we've got this quadratic in T, second order in T, if you want. Uh, there's also, we could write velocity dependent forces or position dependent forces. Uh, velocity dependent forces would be things like viscous drag or um, yeah, damping. And I'm not going to consider that. I'm just going to jump to the position dependent force. So I guess that would be the next simplest. And again, we're just looking in 1D. And there's lot, there could be a really complicated position dependent force, but I'm only going to think of a simple case, Hooke's law or the, the spring system. So a mass spring system. But in general, a position dependent force, say in, in more than just 1D, would be gravity and orbit around the Earth, but also a, a spring. So we'll look at the, the spring for now because it's simpler. The nice thing about a spring is that it's linear. So the dependence is linear. So we'll just look at linear dependence. So the spring mass system, similar diagram to before, we've got a 
we've got a mass, we've got some equilibrium location, but then that compared with the current location, here is um, X and the force F is negative K X where K is the spring constant. So this is considered a you know, F equals negative K X is also called a linear restoring force because it's linear in the, the variable, in this case, the displacement from equilibrium and it's restoring because it's trying to, it brings things back. It always overshoots. So we're gonna tend to get oscillatory behavior, but it's restoring. Um, so here X is measured from equilibrium. And we'll use this location here uh, as our origin for F equals MA. Now we've got something that's more complicated. The force is negative KX and A, we'll write it in terms of X. So it's, we have a second order ODE for the position, right? If you're wondering where this is, you wanna look, it's uh, example 2.3. And they go through this as well. If we put this in the form of a typical ordinary differential equation, then we would have the second order term by itself on one side, usually the left-hand side. And then this would be negative K over M, everything else on the right-hand side. So now this is in the form of A typical second order ODE. And so I'm just try, I'm trying to emphasize that Newton's laws give us differential equations and then we could use techniques from solving differential equations to solve for this. So that's our ODE. And it's, it's also called, if you have anything of, of this form, so I'll say it's something of the form X double dot, equals um, negative CX, where C is a positive constant. Anything you have something, anytime you have something of, of that form, it's called a simple harmonic oscillator. So we're gonna encounter this kind of equation um, when we look at rigid body dynamics. You'll see it in lots of different situations if, if, if you haven't already. And so this is just another example. The spring mass system is an example of a simple harmonic oscillator. And uh, it's, it's known that it has solutions that are oscillatory, but we could just sort of try out something that's oscillatory. What do I mean oscill oscillatory in time? Let's try a solution of the form, and, and not just oscillatory, but sinusoidal. So we're just gonna assume that we have something of this form and then try to find out if it really is of that form. Okay, so this is X equals capital A cosine, uh, no, not cosine, we'll do sine first. Uh, no, cosine, I like cosine. Cosine omega T plus B sine omega T. This is cosine omega t, sine omega t, where a and b are constants. So let's assume that we've got, uh, that the solution has this form, then we could just literally plug this in to this differential equation up here. So we need to take two derivatives of it. Uh, not only are a, b, I guess it's also omega as a constant. All right, so that means take the time derivative, first time derivative, x dot, which is just dx dt of this assumed solution. And I always have to think about what the derivative of cosine is, negative sine. Then we get pick up that omega, omega t plus over here, b omega cosine omega t. 
All right, now two derivatives. What's this? We get negative a omega squared cosine omega t minus b omega squared sine omega t. And if you look at this, um, it looks like we've got negative omega squared times the times a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, which is just the original assumed form for x. So it looks like um, we've got something that's x double dot equals negative omega squared x, which uh, solves x double dot equals negative k over m x for omega squared equals k over m. So I guess that tells us what omega is. And then we're just left to find out what a and b are. So omega is square root k over m. And then we could get a and b. Right, because since this is a second order ODE, it has two in initial conditions. Like we evaluated with the integrals up above, but here the initial conditions are the initial position. So what is x at time zero? And then what is x dot at time zero? So what we'll find is that um, x time zero is equal to a if we plug in and evaluate. And then uh, x dot at time zero is equal to omega b. So that so you could work out what a and b are. The main thing here is that the solution is if we were to plot it, right, this is going to look quite different from the others because it's oscillatory. So for example, here's my I'll just plot this as x zero. I'll have something that's oscillatory. So this is supposed to be a sinusoid. And the period, so the you know peak to peak distance here, we'll call that the period t. Period t, which is two pi over omega. So we got this from assuming um, that it had a solution of that form and then just verifying that it is. So that's that. And this will be useful to refer back to later, even though we're, this is, we're I just said this is kind of, this is 1D, but some of the things we look at later will be able to be decomposed into uh, a one dimensional problem. All right, so that's, that's 1D. Then next we'd be looking at 2D. So these are 2D examples. We're still applying Newton's laws just to particles, to single particles. And uh, we can first look at projectile motion. Why not? Let's do it. And then we'll look at a pendulum. So a projectile. This is not the same. Um, it's similar to, there's something in the book. I'm not gonna do exactly the same thing. You could look at theirs if they want to. Yeah, example. 2.2. That one's looking at you know launching and trying to hit something. Here I'm doing something even simpler. Usually when we think of projectile motion, uh, this would be uh, we're talking free fall motion with no air resistance. If you had air resistance, then you get more complication, and I just don't want to do that yet. So I'm thinking of a, this is a terrible, terrible drawing. It's a rocket or something. And it's initially going to the right with a scalar velocity, V naught, uh, just to orient this. Gravity is down and here is, uh, here's the ground. And this thing starts out at some height, H. So if I start out with some height H above the ground, going with a velocity V naught, 
then I will hit the ground at some distance D from where I started. So we're curious to know where does this hit the ground? How far does it go? So this will be some kind of parabola goes down. So no air resistance. Okay, this is the moon or something. Now, how do we set this up? Now, before with 1D, we didn't really have to worry about there's there's frames. Here, we don't have to worry terribly, but uh, let's set up an inertial frame. So I'm just going to draw this again, but writing N1 and N2, unit vectors that are defining my inertial frame. And at any given moment, so I'll say where this thing is, it, we're treating it like a particle, not a rigid body. So the extent of it doesn't really matter. So there's some point P. So we've got our position, which is the same as the position of point P with respect to the origin O. So we set up an inertial frame, write the position. Um, and then we get to choose, well, how are we going to write this? The forces, so maybe it's useful to write the forces. So here's our free body diagram over here. There's just one force, and it's the force due to gravity. So it's mg, and it's aiming down. So it makes sense because the force is only pointing in the negative n2 direction. So if we were to write this as a force, it's mg in the negative n2. Then we could just use the Cartesian frame. We could use n1 and n2 and then write what this position vector is in terms of x and y. x n1 plus y n2. You might be saying, well, of course we do that. Right, and for some other situations, we might not write the position R in terms of the Cartesian X and Y. We, we might wanna use something else like polar coordinates. And in this case, we'll use just X and Y. And then we'll take the um, inertial, oh, I didn't use I, I use N. The inertial derivative, meaning derivative with respect to this inertial frame N, is particularly easy, X dot, and then the n1 direction does not change with respect to n1 directions. So I don't have to take a derivative of the n of n1. And then y dot n2. You know, well, but let's, let's do that again. We need to get the second derivative because that's the acceleration, right? That's the acceleration vector. Pick up another derivative, x double dot n1 plus y double dot n2. Awesome. Okay. Then we put this into uh, Newton's laws or Newton's second law. So M, um, the book's shorthand for this is R the vector double dot M times R double dot equals the force total force on the body, which in this case is just the force due to gravity. So now writing this out, I've got M X double dot N1 plus M Y double dot N2 equals, um, it's implied there's a zero in the N1 direction and then plus negative MG in the N2 direction. And then I just equate components. If you don't like seeing it this way, maybe you'd rather see it in matrix form. So in matrix form, and we're just reminding ourselves with the superscript, this is in the end frame, M X double dot M Y double dot equals, and this other side is also in the end frame, zero negative M G. They, they are uncoupled. Uh, if I, I can divide both sides by M and I'll get X double dot equals zero and Y double dot is equal to negative G. So I've got in the X direction, there is no force. In the Y direction, there is constant force. And I've actually, I've already solved 
those individually up above in the 1D examples. Um, if we were to summarize what this system is, this is a system of two uncoupled second order ordinary differential equations. It, it, describing it in terms of the, the mathematical problem. Okay, so we, we, we solved the no force and constant force above. It was in 1D, but for each of these, this is no force and it's one dimensional and this is constant force and it's one dimensional. So we can just use what we wrote up above. So let's suppose we have some initial conditions. What were the initial conditions here? Uh, we have the, the mass was moving initially with a velocity V naught to the right. And it had a uh, initial height of H above the ground. And we could say our, our origin was right below where this thing started, this is N1. So the, the initial conditions that correspond to the situation we described would be uh, X zero, the initial X is zero. The initial Y is equal to H. And then what is the initial X dot? This would be the velocity in the X direction. So that's V naught. And we're saying this thing is starting out moving only horizontally initially. So that means that Y dot at the initial time is zero. So using the solutions above for the no force and constant force case, we get that X as a function of time is V naught times T, Y as a function of time is H minus one half G T squared. So this with T as a parameter, this describes a curve, which will then go down so these points, x as a function of time, y as a function of time, describe this, this curve for uh, time t equals greater than zero. This is at time t equals zero. That's our initial time. If our question was, how far does this travel along the ground before hitting? So what's this distance d? Well, we could work that out because we could first find out what's the time t that it takes to hit the ground. So the time t it takes to hit the ground, that would be the capital T such that y of capital T is equal to zero. y of capital T is equal to zero. Well, that means h minus one half g capital T squared is equal to zero. And then you could work out what this means for t. It's square root 2h over g. And then we want to know, well, how far, what's the x distance at that time? So distance traveled horizontally would be x at capital T. So just plug in in this equation up here. This was v naught times any time t. So now v naught times capital T. So this is V naught square root 2H over G. And this is what we called uh, D. It's the distance traveled. Okay. If you had air resistance, right, it'll be less. Okay. The more challenging one, at least using Cartesian components, would be writing the equation of motion for the pendulum. So the book has this in example 2.4, so the pendulum. So this is another 2D example. It's the simple planar pendulum. So the way I think of it is you've got a ceiling and then there's a pivot point or revolute joint. It's, it's a hinge, a hinge joint. 
And attached to that is a, uh, got a massless rigid rod. And then at the end of that is a mass. So that's kind of the physical situation. And a, a nice choice of the uh, inertial frame would be, we've got an N1 direction that is parallel with the ceiling and then N2 pointing up. So just we're using the same type of inertial frame as we used for the problem up above. Gravity here is pointing down. What's the, what's the free body diagram? The free body diagram, if I just sort of plot it right below here, we've got a force along the rod. We might call that the force of tension. You know, these what the book writes, it writes that as FL and then down is force due to gravity, which again is mg. The gravitational force is nicely in the n2 direction. This force due to tension is not in the n1 or n2 direction. So that leads to some problems for us. So what do we do? Well, we could use a polar coordinate frame. So if we use a polar coordinate frame here, what do we get? We would write, so this is where we use a polar coordinate frame. And we'll define it this way. So we'll write, instead of using X and Y, we'll say the deflection of this pendulum, so that rod from the downward position is theta. And we'll define a direction, ER, that's along the rod in a direction, E theta, that's at a right angle to that. It increases in the direction that theta is increasing. And then there is a implied N3 or E3 direction. It's just the out of the screen direction. So if we use a polar coordinate frame, so this is a triad of unit vectors, ER, E theta, E3, and they obey the right hand, uh, it's a right-handed coordinate system, they obey the right-hand rule. So E3 is equal to ER cross E theta. If I put my right, my fingers in the direction of ER cross E theta, my thumb is pointing out of the screen in the E3 direction. So this is a good set of unit vectors to use. So let's, you know, use them. Let's first write our position. What's the position? We'll call this point P and this origin, we'll still use that as an origin. So we've got O and we'll just write along here. This is R. R is R P with respect to O. And we're gonna write it as, uh, we'll call this, the length of this rigid rod is capital L. So this is L in the ER direction. Then if we wanna write, we're gonna to have to take two inertial derivatives of R so that we can get the acceleration. So the first inertial derivative, well, we could just apply what we've used before. We've already done polar coordinates. So we could, we could actually jump to writing, what's the second derivative? Because hopefully by now you have experience using polar coordinates. So this becomes negative L theta dot squared the ER direction plus L theta double dot, the E theta direction, right? We're allowing that theta can change and theta dot is not constant because theta is actually the variable that could be changing with time. That's the only thing that we wanna track. Now, what about the force? So the force, we could write the force due to gravity, right? Um, force due to gravity is mg in the negative n2 direction. And now we write the rotation matrix that relates n2 with uh, er and e theta. So n2 is going to be negative cosine theta er plus sine theta e theta. So we could write this in terms of, of that. So we've gotten cosine theta er minus mg sine theta e theta. What about FL? Force of tension in the rod. 
well, FL as a vector, it's always going to be along the ER direction. And it doesn't really matter if you, how you want to write it. So we'll write it as FL is negative N, just following how the book does it, where N is positive. Then Newton's second law. So that's kind of the setup. We've got Newton's second law, M R double dot with the derivatives taken with respect to an inertial frame equals the total force. And the total force here is the force due to tension plus force due to gravity. So this would be F L plus F G. And we are perfectly within our rights to write, even though we had to take derivatives with respect to an inertial frame, we could write Newton's second law in terms of that polar coordinate frame or the E-frame directions. So we've got um, left-hand side here, negative M L theta dot squared in the ER direction plus M L theta double dot E theta direction equals, what do we have? We have negative, we'll have negative N plus mg cosine theta in the ER direction plus negative mg sine theta in the E theta direction. Or we could write it in matrix form if we want, uh, or we could just separate component by component. So let's look at each component in the ER direction. We've got negative ml theta dot squared equals negative n plus mg cosine theta. And in the E theta direction, ML theta double dot equals negative mg sine theta. From this first equation, you could work out what the tension force magnitude is. That would be n equals ML theta dot squared plus mg cosine theta. That doesn't give us the dynamics. It just tells us the magnitude of a force. The second one tells us the force. So from the second one, we get, if we want to write it in the form of a typical second order ODE, we, we want the variable that has derivatives on it by itself. So to do that, we had to divide both sides by ML. So we get negative G over L sine theta. And this is where the dynamics are. Why isn't this one the, the dynamics? You need to look for the term that has the highest derivative with respect to time. So this is particularly simple. We don't have x double dot equals something complicated with arc tangents and y double dot something complicated. This is just, it's just theta. So this would be easier to solve. Um, of course, this is nonlinear because sine theta is not theta. So this is a nonlinear second order ordinary differential equation. And things that are nonlinear, we don't have any general method to write the solution analytically. But if we look at, if we limit this to small angles, you know, we have some intuition about what a pendulum is going to do. You release it from rest, it's going to go back and forth. Okay, what if you release it at a really small angle? And I guess it's worth noting here, all, all these angles must be in radians. I've sometimes seen people try to do this in terms of degrees and they find that it's just not working out. Radians. So that means theta double dot would be measured in terms of radians per second squared. For uh, small angles, which means small oscillations of the pendulum about the bottom position, we can use the small angle approximation. Uh, for sine theta, which is that sine theta is approximately theta, written in terms of radians, plus, and we'll just say higher order terms. Sometimes I write it this way, big O. And I know that for sine theta, the next term, this is the Taylor series expansion sine theta. And the next term isn't... Uh, something times theta squared, it's something times theta cubed. So it's a pretty good approximation. In fact, 
the the rule of thumb is that uh, this is okay for theta. And now I will write in terms of degrees just because in terms of uh, our intuition for theta less than 20 degrees, this is actually pretty okay. Pretty, it's like within 1% or something. So then if we write this second order ODE and then on the, instead of sine theta, we just put theta. So then this is the, the approximation of the dynamics for small angles. You'll hopefully look at this and go, oh, I've seen this. This looks like something of the form x double dot equals negative c x. It looks like the simple harmonic oscillator. It's just that now x is theta and c is g over l. But we know what the solutions for this thing are. So we just solve the simple harmonic oscillator. So with it, we know solutions are of the form theta as a function of time is a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t with omega equal to, in this case, it's square root g over l. And then you could get, uh, you know, a and b are related to the initial conditions. So whatever the initial angle was and the initial angular velocity of the pendulum. So if we were to look at just in a sort of sketch, right here's theta. If we release this, it's gonna go back and forth sinusoidally. This was theta. So theta versus T is sinusoidal. And with a period, all right, peak to peak over here, capital T. With a period, t equals 2 pi over omega. So it's 2 pi square root L over G, which, right, L has units of length and G has units of length divided by time squared. So this has units of time. And notice the, the oscillations are independent of the initial uh, angle. We are talking about small angles, but for any small initial angle where you release from rest, this is going to have, pendulum has the same period, which is something we know from other earlier physics courses, but we're just seeing it again here. Okay, the point of all this was to give some reason why we want to look in terms of other frames. In this case, this frame, right, was a, you might call it the E frame. I think a problem that sometimes comes up when frames are considered is you you sometimes think of a frame as attached to a point. And so I want to tell you, no, you don't you don't need to think of it that way. These directions, these E directions, are just directions that are somehow rotated with respect to the red N1, N2, and N3 directions. Okay. Don't think of what's the origin of the E frame. Just think of the triad of unit vectors for some of the problems people get confused thinking of. I'm always used to just thinking of frames as attached and pivoting about some point. No, you, you need to think of those directions and how are those directions moving with respect to an inertially fixed set of directions or just any other set of directions. So I didn't, like in this case, I didn't say, oh, the E-frame has origin at blah, blah, blah. I didn't, I just said, there are these directions. We know what they are. ER is in the direction of the rod. E theta is perpendicular to that in the direction that theta is increasing. And then E3 completes the right-handed triad of unit vectors. Let me give you one thing. When you've got situations with multiple things rotating with respect to other things, like in this case, we have, we've got the vertical post and the you could think of this N frame is attached to that vertical post, which is not moving. And then the E frame, right, over here is attached to this, this horizontal post. So it's got the ER direction is along that horizontal post. E phi is increasing in the direction that phi is increasing. And then E3 just completes the right-handed coordinate system. Well, you also have a disc and you're told the disc is rotating as well. So even though you weren't uh, told, hey, attach a frame to the disc, 
it's probably useful to attach a frame to the disc. So if we, let's attach a third frame to the disc and you might give it some name like the P frame. I, I'll call it the S frame. And so we've got a frame that's attached to the disc. And so I would call it S sub R is pointing from, it's pointing towards the point P. And then we've got another direction. And so this is where it might be kind of hard to see. So here's SR. S theta is increasing in the direction that theta is increasing. And now if I say SR is my first vector and S theta is the second vector, SR cross S theta, what direction is my thumb pointing in to get that third direction? Um, it's actually pointing in the negative ER direction. So S three. So I've got SR, S theta, and S three, where S three is in the negative ER direction. And then hopefully this makes it easier to evaluate what is omega of this new frame I've defined, the S frame with respect to the E frame. Well, I curl my fingers, use my right hand, curl my fingers in the direction that theta is increasing. So the direction of rotation. So that, okay, theta dot. And where's my thumb pointing? My thumb is pointing in the S3 direction or you could write it as theta dot in the negative ER direction, okay. negative theta dot ER. So then eventually when you wanna get what is S with respect to N, you add the rotation of the E frame with respect to the N frame, and then the rotation of the S frame with respect to the E frame. And both of these can be written in terms of the E frame, because this is what phi dot E3, and we just found that this is negative theta dot ER. And then uh, right, originally we were looking at R, here's our origin O, and the, the point P as seen by the missile, we might call it rho. So rho is R minus RM, and if you write it that way, hopefully things will be simpler. Okay.